And in my view, after the G7 meet where he met President Zelensky in the first place, then he went to Moscow where he met Putin, and now he is back in, was back in uh, Ukraine. And that's what he has been estimating. The levels of red lines, the levels of comfort, levels of possibility, trust, and the intent uh, to somehow uh, have a ceasefire and then move forward exactly how things are going to work. But as far as I understand, India probably did not uh, present a peace formula. Now that, the, which is indicated from the joint statement that was issued, in which President Zelensky would have obviously said that uh, the communique that was issued in Switzerland should be the basic framework for negotiations. Now, that is completely at variance with what the Russians are aiming at. Of course, they don't want, they want to keep what they have acquired, about 25% of the territory, making it into a buffer zone, as well as uh, Ukraine not joining NATO. For the Ukrainians, this is a red line. So therefore, until unless these two vertical positions are bent somewhat, the dialogue will not be very productive. Uh, there was a possibility within two months of the war, uh, which were really squandered because of the British and the American stance that they wanted to strategically defeat Russia, using Ukraine as a pedestal, frankly. That's what they did. And today we are in a situation where we are. We don't know whether Ukraine will be able to regain it uh, by force or by war, by the territory that this is lost. But only way out will that be through the negotiations, through a dialogue, through some kind of a treaty, uh, which should be supervised by the international organizations or like the United Nations or other in those four provinces. There could be several modalities. But of course, India is against uh, acquisition of territory by force from any country, and we have always respected the territorial integrity and sovereignty for all the countries. In our very first statement, if you remember, when we said respect for UN Charter, it was clearly implicit that it implied that uh, the Russian, uh, the Ukrainian territory was being taken by the Russians. Of course, there are historic reasons. There are NATO expansion and all kinds of things, but nothing justifies the war. A para of the article you have written, quote unquote, no doubt, as external affairs minister, as Jashanka said, it is a very complex issue. Uh, both sides seem to have vertical position, as you mentioned now. It has been a big question to what extent are they willing to bend to come to the table. It appears, despite the war fatigue and exceptional losses in all respect, Kiev, in bracket, backed by its Western allies, and Moscow are hell-bent on carrying on with their quest to defeat the other. So, when you are saying that willing to bend to come to the table, in your opinion, what can bring to the, the both the warring parties to the table? Well, I think that there are several reasons. One is that uh, there is a bit of a fear even in Ukraine that in case the U.S. elections produce Trump uh, on the scene, then obviously that would be a major issue for the Europeans which are, who are supporting as well as for the Ukrainians. Because without the U.S. and NATO support, Ukraine cannot withstand the Russian pressure. So that is very much there. That is one fear. Secondly, I think that with the millions of uh, hundreds of thousands of troops have been killed, millions of people have been displaced. Uh, there is so much a problem. Both sides are in a war fatigue uh, situation. So that is the only incentive today for them. Unfortunately, the negative one. But I think that this is the only incentive for them to come to terms. Only thing is that uh, from Russia's point of view, I think that joining of Ukraine in the NATO uh, would be a very big red line, and which is why this whole war has gone on. And uh, I doubt very much that if that is not addressed, it will be very difficult for the Russians to get on board. So, Romia, you know, one is the strategic interest of the country, but the other is the domestic opinion, the people's opinion, and they shape up the policy. So, in context of any compromise, what is the opinion of people of Ukraine. I think that will matter the most for Zelensky in deciding when to have a meeting with the uh, Your question is absolutely right, um, but we still see the polls and the majority of Ukrainians are not, not ready to start the, any kind of negotiations with the Russians. So that's what I, what I mentioned before. You know, the one thing that's a um, 
that's the wish of our allies, partners, uh, friends to start the negotiations. The others, that's the nation's will. And uh, we don't see now, it's less than, more, less than 50%, you know, um, people are ready. But of course, we, we see how people are tired, how they exhausted. Um, we see the mood in the eastern and southern Ukraine. We see, and we will see even more, when they will um, put down the all energy infrastructure and will face really severe winter. That is a huge threat for us now. And we passed the last months um, without electricity. And probably you remember when your Prime Minister Modi was um, uh, in Moscow, uh, Russians, they hit the children's um, cardio and uh, cancer, the only one and the biggest one hospital. So, the, so uh, after especially these attacks, Ukrainians do not understand what they, why they need to have any negotiations. And why, by the way, the Western, um, our allies and countries, they, especially U.S. and Biden, because my colleague mentioned about the, um, the elections uh, in, in U.S., why they still keep the sanctions to use the long-range missiles on um, striking, uh, striking the Russian territory. That's, I am, I'm talking about the uh, attackers and British uh, Storm Shadow rockets. So that would help us to prevent their shelling on Ukraine and to prevent their moving of the Russian troops to Ukrainian territory. That's a very obvious thing. And I want to just mention that uh, uh, US and Britain and uh, UK they, and Russian Federation, they took the security assurance and guarantees in 1994, citing the Budapest Memorandum, when we were disarmed from the nuclear storage and weapons, which we had the, the third largest in the, after the Soviet Union um, um, collapsed. How difficult for you as a parliamentarian, someone who, uh, you know, someone who has to do both policy making and represent the interest of the people, and also reflect their mood to balance what is strategically important for Ukraine uh, with what people think is right. You know, pe people people can have any expectations in context of uh, what should happen, but what it is in context of the state's power is a different story altogether. Uh, absolutely right. It's difficult for me. It's the most difficult because I'm working with the military, with the military uh, families, with the families uh, who have a missing uh, military um, soldiers, who uh, still have children, prisoners of war, or whose children were kidnapped, for example, uh, in the eastern part of Ukraine. And that's impossible to talk to talk with them about negotiations. We are welcoming. Uh, we are welcome and thankful for to India for um, readiness to be the mediator, yes, and to host the, um, the second uh, peaceful summit. But President Zelensky was absolutely right. It's, it is possible when, when our partners and mediators will accept um, the basic um, Ukrainian peace formula, because the only one thing which is the, the most important in this peace formula, that's a withdrawing the Russian troops. I think that's very obvious, but it's really, it's very, very hard now to talk to, to Ukrainians about the starting negotiations because no one believes that Russia will keep a war and will not start a war in a year or two years. They will just use this time, you know, to strengthen their military capacities and again then okay. to again the, to start the third wave of war and attack in a couple of years. Ambassador Tignayat, if you look at the history of modern warfare, uh, either you have a surrender or you have a settlement of interest or you have a swapping of territory, or if you look at the armistice in Korea, you have exhaustion of all the possibilities. Or the state moves out, saying that we cannot incur the cost of war, which is also a colonial experience. I know you are not our say, but definitely I will take this liberty to ask you this question. How do you see this war ending in the long run? Well, I think there are all losers in this war, like in any other war. Uh, we, but one thing sometimes I wonder and see, uh, that uh, none of the superpowers have been able to win any major war in the 20th and 21st century. Look at the United States, for example. In Afghanistan, what happened after 20 years, they got defeated by this. The era of short wars is no longer there. Those 10, 15 days wars, now we are seeing Russia got in, getting embroiled in this for two and a half years. 
then we see the Middle Eastern war where already 10 months are over and the most powerful army in the Middle East is not able to take on the, uh, the non-state actor. On the other hand, you see uh, Soviet Union, it went into Afghanistan, eventually got disintegrated. You see China, which lost in Vietnam, USA lost in Vietnam. So I don't really uh, find that the superpowers, except for death and destruction, they have been able to achieve much. We have seen what USA has done unilaterally in Iraq, and I was ambassador to Libya when I saw this NATO uh, bombing there. So they manufacture the causes to bomb it for unilateral. This is in the nature of the superpower to dictate its system. Yes. How do you control, as far as this war is concerned, and if I were to go by what uh, Prime Minister Modi's discussions with President Putin and President Zelensky and other world leaders is that everybody wants a war, but I have all uh, wants a peace or to settle this war. And the conflict, of course, the terms of reference are not at all consonant with one or the other. But I have always believed that actually the real uh, any war can only be in this can only be ended with the United States being actively on the side of peace. I, I, are you saying that uh, it cannot be complicit? It's not complicity. It's a question of, you see, that before this war started, what did Putin ask Biden in Geneva? He asked, I want your security guarantees. Guarantees that there will be no further expansion of NATO into my territory. USA refused it because of the geopolitical reasons. They are still driven by this Cold War mindset despite being a hyperpower. And then you cannot justify Russia's invasion. But what Russia eventually had thought, or probably overestimated their strength, they thought they'll be more than warmly welcomed by the Ukrainians when they go in there. Of course, there are certain Russian Four, four of these uh, republics. They thought it's going to be the Hungary. Uh, yes, and it doesn't happen that way. Because, see, in my view, if you know the Soviet history, not the Russian history alone, you will know that the Ukrainians are also very brave people who faced uh, the brunt of the German uh, this thing during the Second World War. So they were all Soviets uh, were together who have suffered this, and they have the tremendous capacity of taking adversity. So I think looking at the people from that point of view, I think that's a historic mistake. But at the same time, from a superpowers perspective, if you were to look at it, that they thought that they were left with no option. That if Ukraine goes into the NATO, that means you have the NATO forces on their borders. So that's something that has been there. So they would need a certain, uh, I would say, guarantees, although I don't believe that any country can guarantee the other. That is a bit naive in today's world, as we have seen these being violated again and again by all the countries. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, but you know, uh, going 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 by the uh, going by the president, I would definitely say, unless and until the, the, you know you have something to exchange or exhaustion of possibilities, or the big brother uh, gives up. Uh, no war in the recent modern times, and you very rightly said, uh, has been won by the superpower. So going by it, uh, the only thing which is of consequences that you don't have winners in wars like that. So the economies bleed and people lose out. So before I end this program, I leave you with the another bite of Zelensky in which he's talking about peace and specifically in the Indian context. India will play this role. I think that India began to recognize that this is not, not just conflict, this real war of one, one man and his name is Putin against whole country, which name is Ukraine. And uh, you're a big country, you have big influence, and you can stop Putin, and you can stop and hold his economy and, and put him really on his place. And his place, you know where.